Welcome to Natural Resources University. This week's episode features Habitat University, hosted by Jared Brooke and Adam Jenke. Welcome to Habitat University. This podcast is your source for the science behind wildlife habitat management and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. We're your host, Jared Brooke. And I'm Adam Janke, and we're both biologists and extension wildlife specialists. If you're interested in wildlife habitat management or looking for ways to improve your property for wildlife, this is the podcast for you. So join us as we talk with researchers, managers, and landowners all about the latest research and the ins and outs of wildlife habitat management. Welcome back to Habitat University. We're continuing our exploration of private lands, conservation opportunities, and we've been through the alphabet soup of government programs, and we've met with people from the federal government, we've met with people from state government, uh, and now we're trying to expand out and see some of these other players that we've certainly heard a lot from, uh, from our state and federal biologists that we've been interviewing, but we'd like to square up and hear directly from a nonprofit uh, wildlife biologist about their approach to private lands conservation. So Jared took the lead on this one. Jared, who'd you have on and what'd you talk about? Yeah. So I had on Brittany Viers, who's the, who works for Quell Forever in Tennessee. She's the Tennessee state coordinator um, for Quell Forever. And so she does a lot of private lands work for wildlife and she's had a lot of different jobs with uh, Quell Forever, you know, starting out as a farm bill biologist and then working up to working with uh, uh, RCPP, which is a regional conservation partnership. I mean, so we covered a lot of different things, just kind of what all kind of opportunities there are from Quell Forever and Pheasants Forever for private lands conservation work and kind of who they employ and how many people they employ. I mean, they have I, I'm not going to get the number right, but it's over, it's in the hundreds of biologists mm-hmm. that work on private lands. And most of those are farm bill biologists, but they have like a wide range of job titles and duties ranging from, you know, foresters all the way to uh, precision ag specialists. And if you're interested in what know what those are, we talk about it in the episode. Uh, but but I, I really enjoyed talking with Brittany. She's a, a long-term friend of mine. I worked with her when I was in Kentucky and she was in Kentucky as well fellow plant nerd. Um, so we, we talk a little bit about plants and the importance of plants, but uh, we, we try to stick to, to private lands conservation as best we can. That's really cool. Um, I've heard, and I don't know if Brittany talked about this, I've heard that the Quail Forever, Pheasants Forever shop is the second largest employer of wildlife biologists in the country after the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Have you heard that? I don't know if she mentions that, but it would not surprise me. Yeah. I mean, if you don't... look on their website, they're, yeah. they have... I know I th- we have here in Indiana, we probably have at least six private lands focus folks from Quell Forever, Pheasants Forever in Indiana. Yeah. I, think th- I think Tennessee's actually get there and Brittany says the number, but they're in the ballpark of getting ready to hire or will be have hired by the time this episode airs, I think nine or 10 folks uh, from Quell Forever in the state. And a lot of those biologists work hand in hand with those programs we've already covered. So there's a lot of synergy between what they do and what a lot of these other groups do. Yeah. Don't quote us on the most employed thing, unless you want to write us and confirm, and then we'll mention that in the next episode. But I, if it's not the most or the second most after the fish and wildlife service, it's certainly up there. And it's, it's a really cool system that we've seen evolved over, evolve over the course of our careers. You were of course, part of that system uh, in your role in Kentucky. And then uh, we've been sort of watching and admiring how lots of people go through pheasants forever and uh, lead to careers in these other agencies we've been interviewing already, or many of them make a lifetime career out of the work with that great organization that cer- certainly does a lot more than quail and pheasant conservation. That's for sure. So it's right. really looking forward to hearing what you had to say or hearing the conversation that you had with Brittany and we'll cut to the episode now. So for this week's episode, I'm excited to have, uh, a longtime friend of mine on the podcast. Uh, that's Brittany Viers with Quell Forever in Tennessee. And Brittany and I have known each other for a while, uh, back to when I was working on a quail research project for my master's degree in Kentucky. And Brittany was working 
on a joint position with Quail Limited at the time and then the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. So we both have a long history with quail, so it's always good to have another quail enthusiast on the podcast. Adam and I talk about them all the time, um, so they're kind of our focal species, we'll say, when we talk about habitat management. So Brittany, welcome to the podcast. We appreciate you joining us. Um, and if you don't mind, you just want to give us a rundown of what you do, maybe your, your background in wildlife and what you do for Quail Forever Now and, and how that position's changed over the years. Sure. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. Um, so I'm Brittany Byers. Uh, I'm the Tennessee State Coordinator for Quell Forever and Tennessee NRCS, also known as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So uh, I guess I'll just start with college education. I went to Murray State, got a bachelor's in wildlife biology, and I stayed there to get um, a master's in botany. Uh, I've always been a big native plant nerd, which is how I got into uh, managing for bobwhites and how I really became much more interested in bobwhite management just because I am just really drawn to their natural habitat. So after college, I had a, sh a short uh, job with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, that was during the recession uh, in 2009, and it was really hard to find jobs in our field. And uh, I think because of all my my plant knowledge and um, my skills with plant ID, uh, I was able to get this job that uh, Jared was talking about at Peabody Wildlife Management Area in Western Kentucky. I worked for Quail Unlimited and uh, the Wendell Ford National Guard military base and uh, for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources as a quail biologist. And so when I started that position, I, I had very little knowledge of Bob Whites. And uh, even though Jared and I were not necessarily there for, a, a, for many years or anything, uh, um, that experience uh, definitely shaped me as a biologist and my career, and I will always be grateful for that time. So uh, as a result of working there, I, I was able to get a position as a farm bill biologist with Quail Forever in um, West Tennessee. Sorry about the uh, the background noise. Um, anyway, so that was back in 2013. I started as a, a farm bill biologist in, in West Tennessee, and I was covering about 10 or 11 counties. And at the time, that partnership was also with uh, Tennessee NRCS and also the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. And there were just two positions through QF and those partners. And so there were just two of us at uh, farm bill biologists running all over West Tennessee, helping landowners, enrolling them in farm bill programs. And I did that for three years. And then I was able to bump up as the senior farm bill biologist, uh, where I had a little bit more responsibilities. Um, I helped our state office, our ecological sciences division of NRCS with uh, some special projects, uh, notably uh, the world sunflower, uh, a species that's uh, federally endangered. And so be, again, because of my, my plant background, I helped them with, with some conservation work with that species. Uh, and then I got this wonderful opportunity um, to be a coordinating biologist implementing an RCPP, which is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And so that's a fairly new farm bill program uh, it started under the 2014 Farm Bill, and we had 11 different conservation partners on that RCPP, and it was uh, implemented in both Kentucky and Tennessee. So uh, I was focusing on um, trying to help folks enroll in EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, and CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, and a little bit of WRE as well, the Wetland Reserve Easement Program. And this RCPP was all specific 
and geared towards native grasslands. Um, our grasslands throughout the Mid-South and Southeast are extremely imperiled. We've got less than 1% of them left, and that definitely overlaps with what we're all trying to do for Bob Whites. Uh, very similar plant communities and, um, you know, their habitat needs very much overlap with what we're trying to do to, to restore native grasslands. So the Southeastern Grasslands Institute was one of the main partners um, on that RCPP as uh, along with the American Bird Conservancy. And so uh, we certainly got a lot done. We got a lot accomplished. Uh, we obligated a lot of the funds under EQIP and CSP um, underneath that RCPP. So that was a, a great experience. But then I had the opportunity to transition to the Tennessee State Coordinator after I was the RCPP coordinator for two and a half years. And so I've been the state coordinator for about a year now. And um, so I'm, I've sort of shifted gears again from maybe not being quite as focused, uh, sort of honed in on grassland specifically, but really helping our whole Quill Forever partner team in Tennessee, um, sort of being their mentor and supervisor and whatever they need. Uh, and then I also have direct responsibilities from NRCS as well, and I'm considered part of the state office. So it's it's been good. Awesome. Thanks for that overview. And I am hearing a common theme amongst uh, most of your position. And it's one of the things that I always appreciated probably the most about you working with you was plants and <laughs> the importance of plants in wildlife uh, manage habitat management and, um, you know, having that botany background, I always appreciated because I was doing plant sampling for part of my master's degree. So if I had mm -hmm. questions about plants, I could always come to come to Brittany. And we always had long discussions about uh, the importance of plants uh, for wildlife. And, you know, I think that's, in my mind, that's one of the most undervalued skills of a wildlife biologist and or a landowner that's interested in managing wildlife is just having some of that plant ID background or plant knowledge of well, what's a good plant for a species of wild, what's bad and, and how to manage them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and whenever I have the chance to speak to college students or even high school students that are thinking about, uh, you know, their career paths and, and um, considering wildlife biology or management or, uh, botany, what have you. I, I just stress the importance of everything we do. Your foundation starts with your plant communities and then also your knowledge of soils. You know, you need to know just the basics, um, soil characteristics and, you know, like the common soil types that are in, you know, whatever region or area that you're working in. Um, so I, I can't stress those two um, points or bits of advice enough. Yeah. So remember that plants yeah. are important. You don't have to be, you don't have to be a botanist like Brittany. No, you don't. You have to at least have a good understanding of how to ID at least some of them. Yes. Uh, yeah. Plants are life. That's right. <laughs> so there's, there's lots of things that you brought up when you're kind of giving your background that I wanted to kind of hit on as we go through this. Um, and so one of the things you had mentioned was that you were a farm bill biologist. Um, and that seems to be a, a very common job title amongst quail forever and pheasants forever. I mean, we have several farm bill biologists here in the state. And if you get on the QFPF website, you, I don't know, I don't know how many there are. There's probably over a hundred farm bill biologists throughout the state. So can you give us a little bit of overview of what a farm bill biologist is and kind of their, day-to-day -day, um, kind of roles and responsibilities, especially related to creating and improving wildlife habitat. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, so first, I'll just uh, share a few things about our farm bill biologists and, and our model. Um, so I think in like back in 2008, maybe 2008 or nine, 
we had the very first farm bill biologist in South Dakota, and he is now also the uh, uh, North Dakota and South Dakota um, state coordinator for both. His name's Matt Morlock. He's a great guy. Um, but just to give y'all some uh, sort of background and history of, of our farm bill biologist program. And so I lose track of this number because we have had so many new positions. I mean, look on any wildlife job board and there's always right. quail forever, pheasant forever positions open, right? Yeah. And I, I think, um, gosh, we are well over 300 farm bill bio positions nationwide. And I think we recently surpassed the U S fish and wildlife service for our private lands staff. Uh, which, and I'm not saying that to brag, but it's, it is a pretty big deal. Um, so I, I just say that with pride. Um, but what's also a little bit unique is we have gotten even more specific than farm bill biologist positions. And we also have precision ag conservation specialists that work directly with row crop producers and some, and in some cases, livestock producers uh, to determine, you know, where those non-productive areas are on their farms and help them either enroll in farm bill programs or just to set it aside and maybe throw in a little pollinator habitat patch here and there, maybe just uh, you know, plant like four or five native wildflowers with some native grasses somewhere. The point being that is their whole purpose is to work with producers to uh, help them sort of um, regain some of those financial losses. Uh, and then we also have grazing specialists and they uh, obviously are working with livestock folks and, um, and they're the experts with helping them establish or establish native warm season grasses for grazing and also for hay production, but also helping them to see what they might have in their seed bank that is beneficial to livestock. So point being, we have more technical specialists now than just our farm bill biologists, which is really exciting. Uh, we also have some coordinating foresters we actually have one here in Tennessee and he writes uh, forest management plans and he reviews uh, forest plans that other people have written to make sure that if the landowner is receiving cost share through uh, farm bill programs that they're, um, you know, they, they meet the specifications for those uh, programs. So, and of course, even our foresters still have quail in mind, you know, they promote a lot of thinning and burning to, you know, reduce the canopy cover and let the sunlight in. But anyway, so all these specialists, all these folks that we have in these various positions, most of them work uh, in USDA service centers where the NRCS and farm service agency folks are working. And so it's really the most ideal way for the farm bill biologist and other specialists to promote what they're trying to do, which is helping private landowners and uh, restoring, whether that be bobwhite habitat or, or, you know, if they're focused on, they, they want to um, plant something that their sheep can graze that's still native and environmentally beneficial. And so, um having that as our core model of these folks being on the USDA network, having a USDA email address, um, also getting uh, constant, consistent communication about updates with the farm bill programs, any kind of changes, stuff that they need to be up to speed on, uh, having the right payment schedules, you know, things like that. So, um, I would just say that the fact that we are working alongside of our NRCS and FSA coworkers is the reason why we have so many positions and how they've been so successful and how the farm bill biologists have been able to work with so many landowners because you're just, you're able to help the folks that are just walking through the door. And also they are the face of wildlife management. They are the technical experts and the technical 
leads for, you know, whatever that inquiry might be. So I hope that. Yeah, that helps that gives a, a really good idea. And I'm going to kind of try to stress that a little further. And I, and I think, you know, I was also a previously a farm bill biologist in Kentucky, a little bit different yes. of a model there back then. It was a joint uh, state and, and NRCS position, but I think one of the important things, the important roles that farm bill biologists play um, is, and you kind of hit on it, is that they help steer some of those practices to be more wildlife, wildlife uh, friendly and, and more beneficial to wildlife. And Absolutely. they serve as those technical experts to where if a landowner walks in the door and says, hey, I'm, I'm interested in um, managing my property for wildlife, like how can I do that? Um, mm -hmm. especially incorporating farm bill programs like CRP and EQIP. Um, you know, NRCS is great. They do a lot of good work, but in my experience, a lot of their, their district conservationists and other employees have a very agronomic background or soils background. Absolutely. And so having those farm bill biologists in those offices is helpful to kind of say, Hey, here's how we can take, um, these practices on farms that maybe are are there to address soil issues or water quality issues and we can steer them towards being more beneficial to wildlife or and, and help landowners not only achieve their soil and water conservation goals but also their their habitat goals as well absolutely and just to further your point the district conservationists and soil conservationists that work for nrcs you know they really have to be the jack of all trades of everything soil and water related and that's a lot. That's a lot that they have to keep up with and that they have to know and that they're expected to know. And so it, it really does help them and it truly gives them peace of mind that they can just say, hey, so-and-so's over here at this desk. They're the wildlife expert. Just go right on over and sit down and, and talk to them. Uh, and so we have to kind of be the jack of all trades of all the wildlife practices. So we uh, are expected to and are able to assist someone that might just want information about native pollinator habitat, or they want to know, okay, well, what can I do that's really good bedding cover for white-tailed deer? You know, so we have to be well-versed in uh, the non-game species, but then also the game species, which is uh, the more common request. But the cool thing is, oftentimes, the management recommendations that we are making for white-tailed deer and turkey, or even sometimes bobwhites, is beneficial to lots of uh, grassland songbirds and rabbits and various, you know, species of bumblebees and things like that. So that's a, a big benefit i feel like yeah there's this kind of side benefits to this those management practices and that's why i think uh quail are such a good species and a good focal species because people know them right especially mm -hmm. you work in tennessee i'm sure most landowners are familiar with the call of bob white so they're kind mm -hmm. of that carrot that get people in the in, inside the inside the office and wanting to do the the work on their property but then you can steer management that's going to benefit quail but also benefit pollinators and, and other species and right so, forth. Um, so an another question for you about kind of the role that um you all play with especially with nrcs programs and farm bill programs and so you know there's a lot of obviously with it being a federal uh, agency and federal program there's a lot of initiatives at the federal level but then you drill down and you get more into state specific initiatives and programs and guidance and so how does how do you as a state coordinator help kind of um, ensure that the guidance across the state is for practices and programs is is going to incorporate wildlife and be as wildlife friendly as possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, what comes to my mind initially is really having good relationships with your partners. Um, and I say that because, so for Tennessee, for example, I work really closely with our state NRCS biologist, Robin Mayberry. Uh, we are also 
great with working together and collaborating and we're also good friends that that, that just kind of happens you know when you work with these folks day in and day out but he and I make sure that all of the partner staff in Tennessee have up-to-date information that they know what's going on that anytime there are changes to programs that we distribute that by email um I mean really the root of of like the answer to that question is just good communication um we have monthly teams calls I have one with just the QF partner staff and then Robin leads one that's for all the partners in Tennessee because that's the unique thing about Tennessee is we don't just have QF partner staff. We have National Wild Turkey Federation, two foresters that are NWTF. We also have uh, four TWRA private lands biologists. And nobody cares where their paycheck comes from because we're all doing the same thing. We have the same goals and we help each other. So, yeah, I would just say being really clear and concise with making sure everyone is up to speed and knows what's going on. And, you know, as far as like unique initiatives, we do have the working lands for wildlife fund pool. um, That is specific. It's like a specific pool of money in equip that is just for anything Bob white management related. And so um, we actually have, Seem to be three positions that are also funded under Working Lands for Wildlife, which is an NRCA, NRCS national initiative. Um, so just making sure that they know their roles and responsibilities um, for that, you know, specific initiative and trying to push and promote Bob White friendly management practices. Um, and it's nice to know that we have a fun pool that's just specific for, for that. So it's been going well. Great. So it's, it's, it's uh, great to see that uh, you all are so tied in with things that are going on at the state level of NRCS because, you know, as new practices come out and new practices change or old practices change and guidance changes, um, it's nice that you all have a seat at the table to kind of help shape those initiatives and shape those programs and practices and things. We're very appreciative of that. Um, So, you know, you mentioned a a whole bunch of different types of positions from pharma biologists to ag specialists, to grazing specialists, coordinating biologists and foresters. And, uh, you know, it sounds like all those folks are working on private lands. And so we're doing a series about private lands conservation. And uh, part of the reason that we wanted to invite you on here as obviously you work on private lands, but QF and PF seem like they have really bought in a hundred percent into private lands conservation. And so why, why do you think that the, the organization so bought in and why do you think that's important from a, a wildlife standpoint? Yeah. So, um, Really, I think the reason why we are where we are today with so many partner positions that are, you know, PFQF partner positions, it's it's kind of like it's been a snowball effect. So we started out just having one biologist here, one biologist there, and most of them, most of those positions began in the Midwest, you know, in in pheasant country, so to speak. And because NRCS is a federal agency and it's, you know, some of these partnerships are through the U S fish and wildlife service as well. I, you know, folks communicate with each other in the conservation community. And I think the partners were starting to see, wow, these folks are really getting it done for lack of a better way to put it, uh, they're really dedicated. They're doing a great job. They're bringing in new contracts. They're helping landowners that NRCS was way too swamped to sometimes help as much as the landowner really needed and was requesting. And so it's like it started It started out small and then it just just started to build and build and build. And so I think I mentioned this, but I started as a pharma biologist in 2013 
and I'll, I'll be coming up on my 10 year anniversary in April. And I've actually got to watch that over this 10 year period. You know, like I said, there were only two of us that started in Tennessee and right now we're at eight and we have funding for seven more. And, and so, and then some of that also comes with, um, other funding mechanisms like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We have been very fortunate to have been awarded uh, several grants over the years that uh, NIFWIF is funding. Um, but again, I think we were also selected for some of those awards because we had already proven ourselves in other positions, maybe either in that same state or in other regions. And so that's just the best way I can explain it. It's just a model that works. It's going well, and it's a very efficient and really cost-effective way for NRCS and these other partners to see that wildlife species are getting the attention that they need. Yeah, it really helps put the boots on the ground to work with very much the so. private landowners. And of course, I'm, uh, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I'm sure Tennessee is much like Indiana in that we are a private land state. I mean, Indiana is 96 to 97% privately owned. So mm -hmm. you can't do a whole lot with wildlife conservation unless you're considering private lands. Absolutely. And that is, yeah, I mean, and that's the reason why our model is all based on private lands because that's where there's this huge need for bobwhite conservation and other, other wildlife species. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've, I've watched kind of watched the evolution occur now over, over time as well. I think one of the, the cool initiatives that's coming out, at least from PFQF and um, at a national level is the, the precision ag specialists and you had mentioned it a minute ago but can you describe kind of uh what's going on with precision conservation and precision ag specialists at qf and pf and how they've been employed on the land mm -hmm. on, the, on the landscape in tennessee yeah so uh we call them PACs for short just because that title is kind of a mouthful <laughs> So we have packs kind of scattered out all over the country as well, um, most of them being in the Midwest, but um, Indiana has one, I, I believe, as well. We do, yep. Yeah. So those partnerships are also pretty unique. Um, some of them are with, um, you know, commercial entities uh, in um, agronomy. Uh, some of them are with, like, co-ops. Um National Sorghum Checkoff, um, uh, Cotton Incorporated, or, or John Deere. Uh, but I, I will say, again, this is an example of what I was just talking about earlier. Our uh, state office recognized how these precision ag conservation specialist positions were going in the other Midwestern states. And so we had a few of them in Tennessee say, you know what, we want one of those positions here. And so, uh, because they saw how successful they were in these other states. So our PACs in Tennessee is funded a little differently from some of the other PACs that are more privately funded. Um, ours is also NRCS based, which is a little bit unique. Some of the others are as well, but um, so, Jacob Taylor is his name, our PACs here in Tennessee, and he has what we call job duties or, or deliverables uh, that are various job duties that are determined by the partners and by Quell Forever. And so NRCS and QF did a really good job of setting up his um, goals or deliverables that are, uh, you know, very much based upon working directly with those row crop producers he does a lot of uh, cover crop emphasis. Uh, he pushes the conservation reserve program a lot because that program has a lot of like buffers and strips and sections of a field that you can enroll 
uh, and put back into native vegetation so that the producer is not having to necessarily take the whole field out of production. Um, it could be a wet spot. It could be a mound or, you know, an increase in topography where it's, they're losing yield. Um, so that's what Jacob is doing. And he's uh, also, you know, working for and with NRCS, just like the rest of us. And uh, I think that the, that precision conservation, precision ag conservation specialist side is uh, mm -hmm. a, a cool one in a, a, a spot where there could be a lot of um, gains and benefits be made on the wildlife side because, you know, if you think about historically, wildlife were a byproduct and a lot of, some wildlife species were a byproduct of agriculture, right? And how agriculture yeah, was absolutely. produced quail and pheasants being mm -hmm. um, big ones and all kinds of other species mm -hmm. as well. And that's kind of shifted as agriculture practices have shifted. And those that the whole precision conservation concept and these specialists working on farms trying to find opportunities where um, you can create habitat on the landscape, but also benefit the producers bottom line, the, you know, their economic yes. bottom line. I think that has some real latitude and can, can go pretty far because then it it makes wildlife be more of an asset to the farm rather than a lot of times they may be considered a, a liability or a risk to where yes if, I, I'm, if i'm, if I'm yeah. going to take this land out of production that means i'm going to lose money on it well now the paradigm shifted of maybe i can take this area that's at that's um not producing very much and i'm not getting any return on investment on it but i can enroll it in a conservation program where i can be paid a rental rate in that area that's uh, a low yield maybe next to a uh, tree line or or a stream or something else now it's making me money and i'm also creating habitat in the meantime yeah yep exactly so i think that's a really cool initiative that's going that uh pf and qf have and glad to see it's being implemented in more states mm -hmm. so i guess being that you work on private lands, what are um, what do you see as some of the biggest opportunities to working with private landowners on private lands? And what are some of the biggest challenges? Oh yeah, um, I think the biggest opportunities are continuing to think outside the box and and partner with other nonprofits and other and other federal and state agencies to continue to carry out our mission on private lands. I mean, that's kind of like thinking of things and answering that question from a broad scale, right? Um, because the more partnerships and funding we can come up with um, and commit, then the more work we're going to see get accomplished as a result. Uh, the challenging parts are, I mean, there's really two things, two main things that come to my mind. It can be disheartening and dis just make you feel disgruntled when sometimes you're working with landowners or producers and they've enrolled their property in a 10 to 15 year CRP contract and then they, you know, decide to take it out and put it back into row crop production. But that is uh, something that you can't let stop you and you can't focus on that. You just really have to continue to be positive because the vast majority of fields that are enrolled in CRP, at least in Tennessee, uh, still stay in. And we work with landowners. I have and I've seen them, you know, re-enroll their contracts. And some of them ha that you inspect have been in for 30 plus years. You know, that's still fairly common. And I know that's not common everywhere, but uh, I would say it is in the Mid-South anyway. Um, it, so, yeah, sometimes you'll give advice and you'll spend all this time writing a what we call a CTA plan, conservation technical assistance. Um, and, you know, sometimes that includes guidance about farm bill programs. And sometimes the landowner just says, 
I, I just want to know what to do with my property. And they seem really enthusiastic and, and eager to get going. And then you spend all this time and then they don't always follow through. So those things can be frustrating. And I'm just being open and honest about being a private lens biologist. But again, you just can't let that get you down. And that's still, um, I guess, in the, the minority of circumstances that we deal with. Um, so, yeah, the one point is you can't control landowners and what they do <laughs> and what they do with their property. Uh, the other sometimes struggle is um, keeping all the balls in the air as the partner biologist, because you are answering to, you know, pheasants forever, quail forever. You're answering to the landowner, you know, and then you're also answering to your other partners, NRCS or uh, TWRA or wh whoever that may be. And so you're just trying to keep everyone happy and uh, keeping everything going. Um, and there's kind of an art to that. It comes with experience and time. It's not something that you just step into a partner position and just automatically know how to navigate through all that. And so we all know that when we hire folks and that's why training is so important. And we spend a lot of time with folks that we recently hire. Um, so that sometimes can be quite overwhelming, uh, but you just do the best you can. And you also develop these skills and instincts on how to handle all those things. Like, you know, the big thing is prioritization, knowing, okay, all right, I have to work on these IR sheets because this is fixing to go into an active contract. So I really have to put, you know, these documents that I have to complete first before I can go visit this landowner that is not interested in a, a program necessarily. So knowing like what you have deadlines for and what you don't um, and things like that. So it just comes with time and experience, like I said. Yeah, I think you hit on one of the the biggest challenges that I see in working on private lands is that, and especially one of the major differences between working on private lands and public lands is that mm -hmm. working on public lands, generally you have uh, almost full control over what happens and it's, you're really thinking uh, long-term and it's going to be, it's going to be there in perpetuity. And, you know, obviously plants change and plant succession occurs and the, the vegetation changes, but you have, you can manipulate that over time and, and really uh, work on it long term. Whereas private lands is, it can be pretty ephemeral, right? One of the challenges I always saw was that um, you may have a landowner walk in the door, you may go on a landowner visit, and you may get them a lot of guidance on on what to do, and then uh, you may never see that landowner again, and you have no idea if they if they took your advice or didn't, or like you said, um, at the end of a ten year contract, it's obviously their their property. They can decide what they want to do with it. Um, yeah. and they can enroll it and they can re-enroll it and they can take it out back into production. And that's just kind of how things occur. Um, so you just gotta, I guess I always thought as myself as at best, I'm an advisor. I, I can just give them information that they're seeking information that's going to be helpful and it's up to them to decide what, that's what right. they can use, what they can do with it. And, but it was always the uh, the small successes and the the victories that kept me going. So, what are some of your success stories on working with landowners, private landowners, and wildlife conservation? You know, I, there there are a lot that I could, uh, ex, you know, give examples for. But the one that really stands out, and that I think I'll always sort of default to when it comes to, yeah, I feel good about that one. It, it really went well and I'm proud of that uh, situation. So there is a little community called Palmersville, Tennessee in, in Weekly County, which is in Northwest Tennessee, uh, not, not too far from where I live. And um, it's just a really special little community uh, lots of folks that have just lived there for generations, have been farming there for generations. And I guess about seven or eight years ago, I was really pushing CRP heavily. And I was doing a lot of 
uh, CRP based landowner workshops in the various counties that I was servicing. And I had one gentleman attend one of my workshops and uh, he had lots of good questions and he was very interested and you never know if that's going to lead to something or not. Right. Well, the next thing I know, he, he calls me like a week later and says, would you come up here and have lunch at my house? And I'm going to invite my neighbors over so we can all talk about the CRP program and you can tell us everything that there is to know about it. And I said, okay, you got it. Uh, I'll be there. And so I showed up and Miss Mary had lunch fixed for everyone. I mean, I, I just, I get goosebumps just talking about this because they're such special people. They really are. And uh, all his farmer neighbor buddies were sitting there and there were six of them. And um, I just tried to be as thorough and specific as possible. Here's the positives. Here's the negatives. That's the other thing when you're, you're basically selling conservation, right? And so you do not want to forget an important detail because if they hear about that from someone else, you know, then they may not view you as credible, you know, so you just have to be very thorough and know all the requirements and, and um, you know, all, all about the financial benefits of these programs. So we went over all of that and I couldn't believe, and still to this day, it kind of shocks me, all six of them enrolled in CRP, either the CP30 AD, Bob White Restoration Program, or CP42, our Pollinator Habitat Program. And so four of the six all had adjoining property. And so we now have over 530 acres of adjoining CRP land in that little area. And I should also mention that area used to historically be uh, native prairie and savanna. So that's pretty cool to try to bring back what has been lost. Um, and then the other two landowners, also, they're actually related to father and son, and they enrolled a big chunk that was over well over 100 acres, and both of their tracks are also very close in proximity. So that's a whole lot of um, restoration that occurred just from having that one CRP workshop, and all of it is still in CRP. Uh, I don't know if that will always be that way because two of the landowners have passed on since we we uh, worked on this, but that will just always be very special to me. And I will always be grateful to all those landowners for making that decision. I, I can recall similar, similar type situations myself. And I think that's one of the cool things about working on private lands is that uh, you get to meet so many landowners that have unique and diverse properties and unique and diverse perspectives. And um, it's really cool to kind of see how much value they put in their properties and how interested some of those landowners are in wildlife conservation and things on their property. So it's really like, mm -hmm. that's that's also what kept me going in those days. Yeah. You had those bad days and, uh, you know, seeing CRP coming out and, and uh, that kind of stuff. But those, those types of uh, interactions definitely are one of the cool aspects of working on private land and working with private landowners. And so I'm yeah, going to, uh, I'm going to back us up a bit. You had mentioned something uh, very early on about a really cool initiative going on in Tennessee in the Southeast. And then you had just mentioned something related to it again. So I'm going to ask you um, about it. So you mentioned restoring native grasslands and savannas. And I know you had mentioned the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, or what's mm -hmm. now the Institute. So can you um, give us a little bit of a background about what the Southeast, or maybe grasslands in the Southeast real quick, and then what the Southeast and Grasslands Initiative is and how it's been implemented? Sure. So, yeah, as far as the status of our uh, native and historical grasslands throughout the southeast like i said they're extremely imperiled so much of it has been um, just wiped off the map um, but when i had that job where i was implementing that grasslands rcpp 
Um, well, even before then, I, I got to be really good friends with Dr. Dwayne Estes, who is the executive director for SGI. And um, for those of you that know Dwayne, you know that he is just uh, <laughs> like a living, breathing tornado. <laughs> he would laugh at me saying that, and I know it wouldn't hurt his feelings, but he just um, sort of decided he, he was kind of going through a rough period with his career and just feeling kind of down about things. And he just thought, I have got to do something for grasslands. We have got to get them back. And that was quite a few years ago. And um, he started the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative about five years ago. I think they just had their five-year anniversary recently. And uh, really, even though it's uh, on a smaller scale, for right now, um, SGI has really grown and developed and gotten bigger with a bigger footprint, much like Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever have. It's all about partnerships, building those relationships. They've applied for many grants. They've gotten awarded many grants. They have also received a lot of private donations because folks are really starting to hear it's sinking in i guess is what i'm trying to say that hey folks just like with bob whites if an eastern meadow large a very common uh grassland bird species that has just plummeted in population if we don't start really making efforts here we're just we're going to lose our biodiversity and it's so rich and our diversity is so high in the southeast um it's just it's so important. I can't stress that enough. And so um, we have, we still have a couple partnership positions with Quell Forever and SGI right here in Tennessee. Um, our coordinating forester that I mentioned, that's in partnership with SGI. Um, our soon to be habitat specialist crew in Tennessee, which that whole crew does nothing but prescribe burning, uh, targeting invasive species, uh, doing timber stand improvement work. Um, that would not be possible without SGI's partnership and uh, funding. And s same with our soon to be Grasslands Outreach Coordinator. So uh, SGI is partnering with QF. Uh, they partner with many other um, NGOs and where they have partnerships with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and of course, I should mention that they are housed and based out of Austin P State University in uh, northern middle Tennessee, a really good school. Um, so, yeah, they have just grown a lot through their own partnerships, their own blood, sweat and tears, lots of hard work, many hours spent writing grant proposals and giving speeches and workshops um, and then again, like I said, those private donations. So uh, I, I know I can speak for Dwayne and the SGI team. They are so thankful and proud to have come as far as they have. And they also have a coordinating biologist in Georgia that's in a partnership with um, the Atlanta Botanical Garden. Um, you know, they have their chief ecologist, Thea Witzel, is based in, uh, in Arkansas. So the whole goal of SGI, as far as grassland restoration, it's it, really their footprint. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. I'm convinced their whole footprint is really all the entire uh, Southeast U.S. and and that's from and that is from an eco region perspective. So like Southern New Jersey, all the way over to Missouri, um, south to if you were to split Texas in half, like the eastern half of Texas. Uh, and this is all like, you know, ecological similarities where you can categorize actual grasslands uh, in the course all the way over to the east coast. Um, so it's a big footprint. But the other thing is that also very much overlaps with the um, northern bobwhite home range. So that's why we love SGI and we like we love partnering with them because there's just so much overlap with the the goals that we're trying to achieve. Great. Yeah, it sounds like a good initiative and in really trying to uh, restore those imperiled ecosystems. So starting from the bottom and and working up to try to 
obviously you restore the plant communities and ecosystems, you're going to get the wildlife species and things back as well. Yes. So they go hand in hand. Absolutely. Um, and so you have mentioned a lot of uh, opportunities and programs for <laughs> landowners and things, not only in Tennessee, but kind of really in, in a variety of different states. Some of the opportunities are similar. So if, if uh, I was a landowner listening and um, I've got the bug now, I want to go uh, learn more about how farm bill biologists can help me on my property. What's the best mm -hmm. way to to work with the farm bio, farm bill biologist or a precision ag specialist, whoever? How do you get a hold of them, and and what do you what do you do to work with them? Yeah, great. I'm so glad you asked that. So, um, first of all, you can check the Pheasants Forever or Quail Forever website. Um, and we're just, I'll say that some, some folks get a little bit confused about this. There's just the distinction between PF and QF, just based on geography. You know, we're in the Southeast, so we're in quail country. We don't have pheasants here. So that's why we identify with QF. Um, but all of our information is on uh, quailforever.org or pheasantsforever.org has a list of the staff in each state and our phone numbers. So that could be the quickest way. But also, uh, if you want to just walk through the door of your county USDA service center or your NRCS field office and just meet somebody at the counter and ask them, hey, do you happen to know who the local farm bill biologist is that services my county? Um, and uh, typically those folks can steer them in the right direction. Also, I'll say that because so many of our positions are also in partnership with whatever state wildlife agency we're, you know, thinking of, sometimes those state wildlife agencies also have a website that has a list of all the private land staff. And so that's really cool because they're going to have uh, maybe the uh, state agency private land staff right along with the Quail Forever staff. So there's probably there's at least two ways that you can find out but but uh oftentimes three i'll just say that awesome any advice for working with a farm bill biologist uh well i guess my advice is just you know try to have an idea of your goals for your property um think about what you want to do but, you know, it's okay if you don't and you just want the biologist to come out and do a field visit and say and explain what the potential is, you know, what's what what can we do here to improve habitat or, or the native plant communities. Um, so it is certainly good to have in mind what you want to do or, or which species you are trying to target as far as management improvements go. Great. Well, I appreciate all the information. You've uh, given us a lot of perspective on uh, what Quell Forever and Pheasants Forever is doing on the private land side. Um, and certainly there's other uh, NGOs, wildlife-based NGOs that are doing stuff on private lands, but I thought it was a good opportunity. We've kind of covered what's going on from a state agency's perspective and then a USDA's per perspective, and now we're kind of getting that um, that NGO side of, of working on private land. So lots of good work happening for wildlife conservation on private lands. Anything else you want to add, Brittany, before we jump off here? Uh, I would say, um, well, advice to fellow professionals, try to, don't give up, number one. I know that's an obvious statement. Um, don't, don't get too discouraged and try to think outside the box. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I never thought that we were going to be a team of soon to be 15 partner staff members in Tennessee. And, um, you know, I never thought that we would have the opportunity to receive funding for a grassland specific outreach coordinator for Tennessee and Alabama. And here we are and the position's been posted and applications closed February the 8th. But, you know, we're just so excited about positions like that, that, you know, were kind of uh, born out of really struggles and issues that we had had in the state regarding quail management. And um, so just don't be afraid to, to try something new. 
don't be afraid to pursue uh, maybe a, an area of interest or, or a major goal that you're trying to achieve in your region. Great. I appreciate you joining us, Brittany. Uh, enjoy the conversation. Always good to catch up and talk with another yes. fellow quail and plant enthusiast as well. So we'll have to maybe just do a whole episode about uh, cool plants and their relationship to wildlife as well. But, you know I'm always up for that, man. <laughs> I know. Can't get enough of it. Fellow plant nerds. So. <laughs> That's right. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And don't forget to like and subscribe uh, however you get your podcasts. And we also have a survey for listeners to help give us feedback on what kind of topics you want um, and how we're doing with the podcast overall. So we appreciate it. Habitat University is hosted by Purdue Extension and Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. The network is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Habitat University, subscribe and listen to the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University Podcast Network. Iowa State University and Purdue University are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions.